about tonight's event with um, Jeffrey Jackson. So delighted um, that we are here to celebrate the launch of, of his, his wonderful book, Paper Bullets. Um, just before I introduce um, Professor Jackson, just a, a few sort of technical notes. Um, everybody is muted other than the speakers. And um, if you have a question, there'll be a chance for questions at the end and you can put your questions in the chat at the bottom of your screen and I'll be sort of fielding them and, and um, we'll be asking Jeff the questions. So that's how we're gonna deal with questions. Um, closed captioning is available. If you require that, you can find the button to turn that on at the bottom of your screen. Um, just also to remind people that you can um, view um, view the events in different ways so um jeff's got a, a presentation he's going to share but if you'd rather just look at him speak you can select speaker view in the top right of your screen if you find um that um easier um so as i say i'm really delighted to be welcoming you this evening to celebrate the launch of jeff's book paper bullets um to <clears throat> oh, hang on, sorry, I forget my screen. Pa paper bullets to artists who risk their lives to defy um, the Nazis. Um, and um, the book has just been long listed um, for the um, Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Nonfiction. It's been very well received. Um, so it's so great to have Jeff here to talk about it. So Jeffrey H. Jackson is Professor of History at Rhodes College, and he is the author of Paris Underwater, How the City of Light Survived the Great Flood of 1910, and Making Jazz French, Music and Modern Life in Interwar Paris, both of which have been received with high acclaim. In addition, he has co-edited The Thinking Space, The Café as a Cultural Institution in Paris, Vienna and Italy, as well as music and history, bridging the disciplines, and the underground reader, sources in the transatlantic counterculture. So without further ado, I'll hand you over now to Jeff um, to talk to you about his new book, Jeff. Well, thank you so much, Barbara. I really appreciate that uh, warm introduction. And it's such a great honor to be speaking um, to everyone, uh, thanks to the Wiener Library, it's a it's a great honor. So, I will speak uh, uh, about uh, paper bullets. I'll probably speak for about thirty minutes or so, uh, and then we'll have some questions at the end. Um, and over the next thirty minutes, I want to tell you a, a, a powerful story about resistance and perseverance in the face of grave danger. That's really at the heart of the book. Um, and what I'll also do is I'll read some selected excerpts uh, from the book as well, just to give you a sense of how I tell the story. Um, and I've lightly edited those excerpts tonight just for, uh, for clarity. Um, and as Barbara said, uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. I look forward uh, to doing that. So make sure to write your questions um, in the chat. All right, I'm going to try to share my screen here. And does that look good on your end? All right, thank you. <coughs> All right, well, um, I want to, um, begin by introducing you to, if I can get my, there we go, um, to the two remarkable women at the, at the heart of Paper Bullets. Um, and if you know something about art and the history of art, and especially the history of photography, um, you may have heard of them before. But even if you do know their work, um, you may not know much about the story of how and why they fought the Nazis for four years. Uh, this story has really inspired me uh, and a lot of other people that I've talked to over the years. And so I'm really glad to be able to share it with you uh, tonight. So meet Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Malherbe, two of the most unlikely Nazi fighters that most of you probably never have heard of. They were both Parisian artists. Lucy was a writer and Suzanne was an illustrator uh, who had studied in art school when she was young. Together, the two of them collaborated on what people in their own day saw as some sometimes shocking photographs, and I'll show you a few in just a moment. They were friends with and influenced by many of the great modern artists in Paris of their day, Picasso, André Breton, Salvador Dali, Jean Cocteau, but their images turned ideas about gender and identity on their heads. More than anything, that's what they're remembered for today. And if you know them, uh, if you know their work, you know them under different names. You know them under the names of Claude Cahun 
and Marcel Moore, and I'll say more about their names in just a moment. But after they left Paris and that they left the art world behind, they put their skills as artists to work fighting against the German army on the island of Jersey, of course, one of the British Channel Islands. They used their creative powers to get inside the heads of soldiers. In brief, here's how it worked. Lucy and Suzanne created a psyops campaign, a psychological operations campaign that was designed to demoralize soldiers, telling them that the war was a lost cause and trying to convince them to go home to their families. And they did it in a very unexpected way with notes and messages, summaries of BBC news reports, drawings, songs, body jokes, and provocative slogans, all written or typed on little slips of paper like the one you see on your screen. And they left them around Jersey for the Germans to find. In some cases, they even put their notes directly into the pockets of the soldiers themselves. Now I wanna um, begin by reading the first excerpt uh, for tonight. This is the opening scene of the book um, that tells us more about how they went about this project. On the morning of July 25th, 1944, Lucy Schwab and Suzanne Maler went into saint Helier to do some shopping. The trip was part of their regular routine. Outside the offices of the Jersey Evening Post, they glanced up at the large clock at the top of the building. Suzanne leaned in and whispered to Lucy to keep watch. Then Suzanne scanned the long row of police cars the Nazi occupation forces always parked along Charles Street, a reminder of how heavily the Germans censored the island's only newspaper. Suzanne took a small piece of paper out of her pocket and began moving carefully toward one of the police cars as Lucy stood by on lookout duty. Suzanne stuck the gummed paper on the windshield. It read, the cowardly bureaucrats of the police who live on lies and shameful cruelty will be destroyed by the soldiers with no names. No one seemed to be paying any attention to the middle-aged women in Burberry trench coats with bright scarves tied around their heads. Suzanne quickly attached papers to a few more windshields and casually strolled away her Wellington boots thumping on the pavement. If anyone asked the women what they were doing, their shopping bag would provide a ready alibi. After finishing their secret mission, along with some mundane errands, they met up with their housekeeper, Edna, and boarded one of the wood-burning buses to head back home on the other side of the island. Lucy held a package of cigarette papers they had just bought at the newsstand. These papers were destined to become a new batch of notes for the Nazis. In her pocket, alongside more of their notes, Suzanne could feel the bright blue milk of magnesia bottle. It did not contain the digestive medicine, however, but instead an overdose of the powerful barbiturate Gardenol in case the Germans caught them in the act. With no warning, the bus came to an abrupt halt and a fair-haired soldier climbed aboard. Everyone off the bus, Lucy clutched her parcel a bit tighter. Outside, the soldier approached each commuter. Suzanne noticed his bright blue eyes. Please show me your papers. How old are you? What is your occupation? Where were you born? Where do you live? How many children do you have? With this critical eye, the German carefully looked over each passenger's documents until satisfied, saying very little other than what was necessary to get his answers. If something was suspicious or if passengers had forgotten their documents, they were told, someone will visit you in your home. Then the soldier approached Lucy and Suzanne. Lucy recalled the scene several years later in a scrapbook of notes that might have formed the basis of a memoir if she had lived long enough. She titled these reminiscences, the mute in the middle, <clears throat> excuse me, the mute in the middle of the muddle. Show me your registration card, the German demanded. He stood in front of Lucy, glaring at her. A look of recognition crossed his face when he saw a familiar name, Schwab. What kind of name is that? The document listed French as her national origin. She explained nervously that she was an orphan and raised by a Frenchman. Perhaps you are Alsatian. Maybe, she replied, but admitted that she didn't really know. Lucy stated that she had been on Jersey for some 30 years. Nearly everything she had just told the German about herself was a calculated lie. She invented a new backstory for herself and not for the first time. As the minutes ticked by, Lucy waited patiently next to the bus and watched the soldiers scrutinize her documents. Suzanne and Edna were close by but could do nothing to help. Lucy, perhaps coughing or stumbling a bit, played sick for the German's benefit, brushing off her acting skills from her Paris days when she took part in avant-garde theater productions. Finally, the, so the soldier handed back Lucy's papers. When he wrapped up his examination of all the passengers, everyone reboarded the bus. An acquaintance riding with them tried to break the nervous tension created by the ordeal. They have not caught you this time, she said, laughing, unaware of what Lucy's parcel of cigarette papers was destined for. Now, <clears throat> I'll tell you more about how they did all of this in a moment. But first I wanna tell you a little bit about their background because one of the questions that I had to ask myself as I did this research was, why would two women with so much to lose put their lives on the line in the way that they did? 
And I also had to think about another question. What was it about who they were that gave them the strength and the power to become resistors? After all, most people did not become resistors during World War II. Well, part of the answer to those questions, I think, lies in their personal histories. Lucy and Suzanne grew up around the turn of the 20th century in the southern French city of Nantes as daughters of wealth and privilege. Lucy's father was a newspaper owner and editor, and Suzanne's was the head of the medical school and a well-known physician. So they were never starving artists, even when they moved to Paris as young women in the 1920s, um, in the, when they were in their 20s, just after World War I, to pursue their artistic careers because they always had family resources. One reason they did not become famous in their day, even in the art world, is that they never really needed to publicize their work in order to make money. Now, they were known in certain circles, such as among the surrealists with whom they were friends, but for decades they were largely forgotten until being rediscovered in the 1980s. Yet to become resistors, they would need to give up the privileges, uh, the privilege and the comfort that they were born with. But why would they? Well, there were some key things about their life stories, which although they did not know it at the time, would set the stage for their resistance against the Nazis. First of all, Lucy's father's family was Jewish. Although he was assimilated and didn't practice the faith, Lucy embraced elements of her Jewish identity that were taught to her by her grandmother. There were also several rabbis and scholars of Jewish life in the family. Lucy was four years old at the height of one of the worst anti-Semitic episodes in modern French history, the Dreyfus Affair. Now that's a complicated story and we don't have time to go into it here, but it led to crowds outside the family's apartment shouting, down with the Jews. Later when Lucy was 12, she was, uh, she was attacked by other children in school who pelted her with rocks and anti-Semitic taunts while she lay helpless on the ground. Lucy and Suzanne, would, both of them would remember these horrible days and the memory would fuel their hatred of fascism and their willingness to fight it. A second factor that allowed them to become resistors was the fact that they were in love. Lucy and Suzanne had met as young girls in the elite circles of Nantes society and they had played together from childhood. By the time they were teenagers, they began a relationship that was in tension with a conservative French Catholic society that valued respectability. Most people in France at the turn of the century did not see a lesbian couple as respectable. Their connection was made even more complicated by the fact that in 1917, Lucy's divorced father married Suzanne's widowed mother, making the girls stepsisters. But their feelings were powerful. Lucy wrote in a thinly veiled article published in a Nantes-based literary journal that her feelings for Suzanne were her idée maîtresse, her main idea, and her guiding principle. I am in her, she is in me, and I will follow her always, never losing sight of her. And you can see on this image on the right-hand side of your screen um, that, that uh, Lucy drew, the initials LS, Lucy Schwab, and SM, Suzanne Malherbe, all run together um, as the initials LSM. And when you pronounce those letters phonetically in French, it creates the sentence LSM, which means they love each other. And drawing on their own experiences, Lucy and Suzanne also explore gender and sexuality as fluid and changing categories. This is one of the things that they are most famous for today. And in fact, as I said before, they're not known in the art world as Lucy and Suzanne, but rather by the gender neutral artistic names which they took, Claude Cahun and Marcel Moore. In French, really the name should be pronounced Claude Cahun, um, but most English speakers, especially in the United States that I, uh, that I know have, tend to pronounce Claude Cahun. I may switch back and forth, but I'll try to say uh, Claude Cahun uh, in the, my talk tonight. Now they assume these new names, these artistic names to create new identities and also to cross gender lines. Claude in particular is a name that's used by both men and women in French. Cahun put it this way in a memoir that she published in 1930. She wrote, masculine, feminine, it depends on the situation. Neuter is the only gender that always suits me. If it existed in our language, no one would be able to see my thoughts vacillation. So gender was for Cahun situational, conditional, fluid, depending on the moment. Lucy's new name also allowed her to express her Jewishness. And in fact, it was as much about Jewishness as it was about gender. Cahun was the name of one set of Lucy's grandparents, in particular, the grandmother who taught her about Judaism. Cahun is the French version of Cohen, the Hebrew word for priest. Like many other artists of their day, they created work under these new names, but these identities also allowed the women to slip the trap of traditional bourgeois society. Yet throughout their lives, they always called one another Lucy and Suzanne, and the historical documents are very clear on that. We tend to know them through their art. People today tend to know them through their art, so we they often get called Cahun and Moore, um, and all the scholarship on them refers to them as Cahun and Moore. 
but um, <clears throat> but they refer to one another in their own day, in their own time, as Lucy and Suzanne. Those are the names, in fact, on their tombstone. Now, if you've seen their work under the names Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore, you know of the ways in which their photographs depict Cahoon, Lucy, in gender ambiguous dress or pose, playing with notions of masculinity and femininity, in some ways helping to invent the notion of what we would now call queerness long before our current understanding of that idea was created. In fact, many queer and transgender people today see them as early heroes and role models. Their photos deconstructed gender categories, showing them to be masquerade and performance decade before most scholars would take up these questions. Cahoon put it this way in her autobiography. She wrote, I shave my head, wrench out my teeth, my breasts, anything that is embarrassing or annoying to look at, stomach, ovaries, the brain, conscious and covered in cysts, suggesting that altering gender and sexual identity was part of the goal, and so is creating a new self. Musician David Bowie, well known for his own gender ambiguity, mentioned a 2007 posthumous show of Cahoon and Moore's photography on his blog. I find this work really quite mad in the nicest way, Bowie wrote. Now that ability to cross gender lines would become crucial to Lucy and Suzanne's fight against the Nazis. So keep that in mind as I'm speaking. So Lucy and Suzanne spent the 1920s and most of the 1930s in Paris, but they decamped to the island of Jersey in 1937 when they were both in their late 40s. They had vacationed on Jersey many times over the years, so its beaches and its natural beauty were very familiar to them. And I'll say I spent some time on Jersey myself doing research for this project and I can completely understand why they would, would want to move there. Jersey's a lovely, uh, a lovely place and I had a great time visiting there. Um, Jersey was also a perfect respite for Lucy's chronic ill health. She had a number of uh, medical conditions through which Suzanne had helped to nurse her over the years. And by this point, Paris had become deeply politically polarized um, with various groups throughout the 1930s literally fighting in the streets. And with fascism on the rise across Europe, Jersey offered a peaceful respite. So when they left Paris and they left the art world behind, they stopped using the names Claude Cahoon and Marcel Moore and returned almost exclusively to their birth names, Lucy and Suzanne. That's part of why in the book, I refer to them um, almost entirely as Lucy and Suzanne because I'm dealing mostly with their post Paris lives. Little did they know though, that when they moved to Jersey, they were stepping into what would soon become a war zone. When the fighting broke out in Poland in 1939, Jersey seemed far away from the action but by 1940, the Channel Islands would become the front lines. The islands were the only piece of British soil that the Nazis conquered, and they were crucial to what Hitler called his Atlantic Wall, a line of defense in the West designed to keep the Allies at bay. And you can see on the map on your screen the, the place of the Channel Islands uh, in that, that Atlantic Wall series of fortifications. Thousands of German troops soon arrived in Lucy and Suzanne's adopted home to build fortifications, which would be used to protect the continent from Allied assault. It was so important that Hitler personally received regular updates from the islands. No dissent could be tolerated in such a strategically important location. But dissent is exactly what Lucy and Suzanne did. Back in Paris, they had been involved in left-wing politics, befriending communists and other radicals. They had signed petitions and open letters against the rise of fascism and protesting anti-immigrant legislation. Lucy had written a letter to a magazine supporting gay rights. So by the time they arrived on Jersey, they had been rebels for some time. Add to that their own lives as lesbian partners lived in opposition to the mores of their day and their provocative artwork that challenged notions of beauty and gender identity. Ultimately, all of the strands of their lives came together to not only give them the strength to resist the German occupation of Jersey, but to give them the skills to do so. They put their creative talents, their political inclinations and their personal backgrounds into their work and it gave them the tools to fight back. Resistance was not an afterthought, but the peak and the point of their creative lives. Most importantly, their love kept them going as they supported one another through what were some very scary and some very stressful moments. I really don't believe that either woman alone could have done this work. I think that just like their art, their resistance was something that came out of their relationship and their love. Now, as I said before, their desire to resist led them to write notes to the Nazis, something that on the face of it seems small and even inconsequential. But the notes that they wrote were powerful indeed. All of these messages were designed to demoralize the troops or to convince them to desert or to mutiny or to go back to their families in Germany. And the German army took them very seriously. For four years, the secret field police, which was tasked with keeping order in occupied territories, tracked them, trying to find out who was leaving these notes all around the island. Sometimes the agents would find them on fence posts, sometimes on cafe tables, sometimes tucked into magazines and newsstands. 
sometimes placed inside German staff cars parked along the street, or sometimes even in their own pockets. The women even hung a sarcastic banner over the altar at the church near their house, where some of the soldiers worshiped, reading, Jesus is great, but Hitler is greater, because Jesus died for people, but people die for Hitler. So what they were doing with these messages was scaring the Germans, the German command, into believing that a conspiracy was afoot on the island, this strategically important zone about which Hitler received regular updates. Was there someone on the island threatening the Atlantic Wall that protected Hitler's con conquered continent from Allied attack? The notes only served to stoke the Germans' paranoia. And I'd like to read a second excerpt now. This is the, the part of the story where they are, uh, where they're arrested. During a quiet dinner, a fist pounded at the door. It was the moment Lucy and Suzanne had been expecting every day for nearly four years. The only question was whether the Germans were clever enough to have discovered the women on their own or if someone had ratted them out. Suzanne got up from the table, walked to the door and pulled it open. Having studied these men carefully from afar for a long time, Lucy and Suzanne knew that they would not be smiling. Five men stood on their doorstep, including the chief of the secret field police, Captain Boda, and a fair haired man with bright blue eyes who wore mustard colored plus fours. Suzanne greeted them with a simple good evening. With a surprising graciousness, the fair-haired man clicked his heels and made a deep, respectful bow from the hips. German secret police, Suzanne rem remembered him announcing politely, we come to search your house. Boda strode to the window seat and made himself comfortable, perhaps puffing on his cigar, while the fair-haired man, whom the others called Carl, started to run excitedly back and forth throughout the house. They ransacked every corner, pulling out all the drawers, prying into every nook and cranny of Suzanne and Lucy's lives. From his perch, Boda watched with suspicion as the two tired women, their faces wrinkled and hair graying, stood by. Too late, Lucy announced in English, knowing that these men did not speak French and herself unable to speak much German. Germany has already lost the war, she proclaimed. Lucy and Suzanne remained calm, but their maid Edna panicked as the men ravaged the house. She knew everyone in the household had been breaking German regulations by hoarding food. Perhaps she worried that she had let something slip about the illegal radio. Carl came over to Lucy and stared down at her. And what do you think will happen to you? You tell me that, he shouted, his calm and polite demeanor at the door, now gone as the adrenaline from the thrill of the chase pumped through him. I think that probably you will torture us and shoot us afterward, Lucy replied flatly, as though she always had known and accepted that this would be the outcome. Carl was stunned silent. These women were not hysterical or even surprised by a raid on their house, but were already anticipating their own deaths. I believe that until that moment, he had thought us unaware of the risks we had been taking, Suzanne reflected. Carl looked at Boda, then back at Lucy and Suzanne, but we'd never do that kind of thing, he proclaimed indignantly. That is BBC propaganda. Lucy glanced back at him, raising her eyebrow in disbelief. Now the notes that frightened the Germans the most were the ones that Lucy and Suzanne signed, but they didn't sign with their own name. Instead, they signed with the name of an author that they had invented. They created a fictional persona and pretended to write messages from that perspective in German since Suzanne was fluent. But the persona here was significant. They called him the soldier with no name. In other words, they crossed gender lines once again, this time in effect becoming, so to speak, a German soldier. And when they wrote notes in this male German voice aimed at the other soldiers, they made the secret police believe that the threat was coming from within the German army itself. And this was, I think, one of their innovations. Note writing was not unique to them. There are many cases of people living in German occupied territory and even within Nazi Germany itself, writing notes as a form of dissent. But most of those notes were aimed at the civilian population, reminding them to keep their spirits up or calling on them to resist the Nazis. As far as I can tell, Lucy and Suzanne were unique as civilians aiming their notes at the German soldiers themselves. The only real parallel that I could find was the Allied PSYOPs campaign which dropped German language leaflets behind enemy lines, encouraging soldiers to desert or to surrender. So what Lucy and Suzanne were doing here was essentially rewriting the inner script or what the political theorist James C. Scott calls the hidden transcript that the Germans told themselves about how the war was going. They were getting inside the minds of the soldiers and sowing seeds of doubt and dissension, spreading ideas that they hoped would go viral, so to speak, among the troops. Someone I was recently talking to sort of likened them to internet memes that circulate. If a German soldier read their notes signed by this soldier with no name and believed that they really were written by a comrade, 
then Lucy and Suzanne hoped he might think twice about what he was doing on Jersey. Maybe he would even mutiny or desert. Now, of course, I don't have time to tell you the whole story uh, here tonight, but suffice it to say that they were indeed arrested by the secret field police, as we heard in the last excerpt. They were interrogated. They were put on trial on November the 16th, 1944, 76 years ago this month, and they were sent to prison and sentenced to death. And the next uh, excerpt that I want to read to you is an excerpt from, uh, from the trial. <clears throat> The judges and lawyers convened in large imitation leather armchairs on one side of the table. Lucy and Suzanne's chairs, placed opposite the Germans, were so large that the women could not use the armrests without spreading themselves unnaturally wide. So Suzanne rested her hands in her lap. Lucy, thinned by illness and lack of nourishment, was curled up in one corner of her chair like a child who climbed in a seat made for a large adult. Behind them were two rows of spindly gilt cane chairs. Captain Boda, wearing a white jacket and smoking his cigar, balanced on one of them. On a table lay all the items confiscated during the raid, including their Phillips radio, their Underwood typewriter and Kodak camera, two guns, books, articles published by Lucy's father, one of Suzanne's wooden crosses that Lucy had planted on a soldier's fresh grave, pieces of fabric, and a few of the coins on which the women had painted down with war and nail polish. These once familiar things now seem strange, so out of context in a courtroom rather than at home. This collection looks like a sort of junk shop, Lucy Riley thought. Also on the table sat Boda's fat file, which was packed with their notes. The approximately 300 scraps of paper were now entered into evidence, um, but they were only a fraction of what they had produced, 1 20th, Lucy claimed. Her estimate was different from what Suzanne recalled, but of course, neither had really been counting. The other noteworthy feature in the room was the three quarter length portrait of Hitler that hung over the fireplace. He appeared to be presiding over the trial. Lucy recalled the large windows of the courtroom filled with, with the, the sunshine from the beautiful day outside, even describing the room as hot. What a luxury, she thought, compared with their cold prison cells. Two large comfortable armchairs in the front row next to one another. What a delight, we are at the show, Lucy remembered with more than a bit of sarcasm. The decor, the actors did not disappoint us. Rather than reading the indictment or inviting the prosecutor to begin, the chief judge, Oberstabstrichter Harmsen, began by questioning Lucy and Suzanne in German about their responses during their interrogations. Then he asked about some of the evidence he felt had been ignored, peppering the women with a string of additional queries. Any previous convictions, Harmsen asked, have you ever appeared before a court? And never, Suzanne answered in German, speaking for both herself and Lucy. Harmson turned the proceedings over to the prosecutor, Lieutenant Lung, so that he could make the formal case against the women. And for the next few hours, he did just that. Lung began by focusing on several of their leaflets and messages to the German troops. One of those was their darkly funny version of a heroic song. The interrogator had asked them about it, and Suzanne had not denied that it crudely shamed German women and embarrassed German men. Lung read the song in its entirety to the court. The refrain joked, and when I came home on leave, my wife was pregnant. Don't be cross, my little boy, she said. The fatherland needs soldiers. This is an insult to German womanhood, Harmson declared. One of the other judges, deeply offended, refused to look at Lucy and Suzanne. By no means, Suzanne protested. I have simply tried to show the kind of situation that would arise if a woman actually followed the directives of the party. The men at the table sat silently as Harmson nervously shuffled his papers. Perhaps I should have made it clear that the father of the many children the song went on to mention was always an Aryan. She quipped slyly. Harmson put the leaflet down and picked up another. When it came time to pass sentence, Harmson was blunt. You are franc tireur, he declared, using the French term for guerrilla fighters or irregular military shooters, even though you used spiritual arms instead of firearms. He gave a brief summary on why their actions were so significant and why he had condemned them as dangerous political criminals. It is indeed a more serious crime, he claimed. With firearms, one knows at once what damage has been done but with spiritual arms, one cannot tell how far reaching it may be. Lucy could not help but think, we couldn't have put our defense any better ourselves. So even during their time in prison, the women kept up their efforts at defying the Nazis as they befriended guards, they passed notes, uh, and they comforted other prisoners. The book is full of surprising episodes of what took place in those moments. Uh, German guards, both frightening and humane, prisoners keeping one another's spirits up with singing, Lucy and Suzanne smuggling notes to one another and during the night, uh, tales of German deserters being hauled off to their execution, leaving the women to wonder when their turn before the firing squad would come.
But there's one story in particular that stands out because I think it highlights how important their relationship, their love story was to making all of this happen. As Lucy was being interrogated by the secret police, she made a stunning admission. She blurted out, I am on my father's side of Jewish origin. She admitted to being an unregistered Jew living in Nazi occupied territory, thereby putting herself in grave danger. Then she confessed to the supposed crime, telling her interrogator that she wrote all the notes by herself and that the whole thing was her idea. She was trying to convince her interrogators that she alone had the motive to become the soldier with no name. But in reality, she was not claiming credit for their work as the true mastermind behind the campaign as some scholars have believed. In fact, Lucy knew just how much of their resistance Suzanne was responsible for. Lucy wrote that it was more often me who accompanied Suzanne, she who took the initiative, which required the most sang froid. Instead, Lucy's calculated risk in admitting her Jewishness was an attempt to take the fall and to save Suzanne. If the police believed that Lucy alone had the motive to write the notes, then the woman she loved might somehow get off. Now, Lucy and Suzanne survived the war, but they had to work hard to make sense of it. What had it all meant? After all, they did not drive the Germans from Jersey with their notes. But in some very important, very personal ways, their effort was a success. And it's something that speaks to us today about the power of creativity and imagination and persistence, especially in our trying times. I think they've left us with a story about how even small acts of protest and refusal can have significant effects that are hard to see until later. And they also remind us why history matters, because in the midst of our present day difficulties, a global pandemic, deep political polarization, economic uncertainty, we can look back to the stories of people who had it far worse, but who somehow still survived. So I wanna close with a final excerpt from the book where I talk about how Lucy and Suzanne tried to make sense of everything that they had gone through. After the war, one day in St. Helier, Lucy and Suzanne encountered a woman whom they had never met before. She stopped them and proclaimed, I'm so happy to see you alive. Several others also gathered around to greet Lucy and Suzanne. They were in disbelief to learn that the women had survived their ordeal. It must have been a dreadful experience, the woman continued. Now you must forget all about it. Lucy and Suzanne were left dumbfounded by her blithe advice. Later, Lucy sat on her bed, leafing through a stack of papers. Next to her on a small table where she placed her tea tray, sat the square hat box of one of the German guards had given to her last August as a place to keep her personal items. Other than her memories, the miscellaneous mementos inside that, this box were all she had left of, the, of their months behind bars. Of all our baggage, she said, the hat box was the only one that had any value. She determined that she would organize all the prison communications, letters, drawings, and notes between her and Suzanne. Few of the documents from their earlier lives had survived the occupation of their home by Germans. She speculated that the, that the soldiers had used them to light fires in the fireplace. Lucy gave some papers to a friend on Jersey and she sent a few other items to friends back in Paris, but the ones with the most personal meaning did not leave that box. The memories were too precious. When Lucy couldn't sleep, she reread the notes Suzanne had written to her during their prison stay, some of them on sanitary napkins and felt strangely nostalgic. But as the days went on, her thoughts began to darken. Lucy had always been the more pessimistic of the two, prone to depression and suicidal feelings, and her gloomier meditations in the aftermath of the war echoed that part of her personality. She later wrote about how she had become possessed in those days by an overwhelming fear that all her struggles had been for nothing, that there were no greater lessons to learn from all the experiences she had lived through, Suzanne's suicide attempt, their pl home plundered, illness, death. In the months after the war, they even had to put their beloved cat to sleep. Lucy likened herself in her reminiscences to a repeat offender Lazarus rising from the dead over and over only to witness still more suffering. Throughout the years that followed, she wrote about the war in lengthy letters to friends and in early drafts of what might have become a memoir had she lived longer. These writings were not the sort of quest for personal identity that she had composed as a young woman in the 1920s and 1930s, but were rather an attempt to make sense of what the war and their time in prison had meant in broader, more universal terms, despite her underlying fear that there was no such meaning to be made. But there had been a point to what they did. Lucy wrote in a 1950 letter, from July 1940, the invasion of Jersey, until May 1945, the liberation of the Channel Islands, yes, even in prison, even in secret, I wrote to encourage men, including the German soldiers, to liberate themselves. Whether such self-liberation took place was easy to doubt. 
Yet there were occasional glimpses of something that might offer a larger perspective and a sense perhaps of vindication. In January 1946, for example, Suzanne received a letter in German from a POW military hospital. It was from Heinrich Ebers, one of the men who had guarded Lucy and Suzanne in prison. Surely German jailers did not typically write to their former inmates. His family was alive and in good health, he reported, and the British were treating him well. He asked Suzanne to greet Lucy and to write him back. In some strange way, perhaps Heinrich, the German guard, had liberated himself and wanted them to know it. Lucy and Suzanne had liberated themselves through their resistance work too. And Lucy in particular had struggled with the question of identity her whole life, from her youth in an assimilated Jewish household during the heat of the Dreyfus affair, to her struggles with her mother's mental illness and her own poor health. Her early writing as Claude Cahun was inwardly focused and tortured, an extended attempt to answer the question, who am I? Which neither her book nor her evolving self-presentation or her numerous aliases or her radical politics could ever seem to resolve. She was always looking for more. Lucy finally found her identity through the soldier with no name, and so did Suzanne. The war was the one moment in their lives when they seemed to have the strongest sense of purpose and the most direct vision about who they wanted to be. Against the Nazis, there was a moral clarity and certainty which their earlier work did not always have. The soldier with no name finally liberated them to speak as loudly and as distinctly as they wanted. Well, that's the end of my remarks, and um, we'll take some questions here in a second. I do have some additional upcoming events if anybody's interested in, uh, in hearing more. And um, let me unshare my screen. You can find out more, of course, at my website, jeffreyhjackson.com um, as well. I'll stop sharing my screen, and hopefully you can see me <laughs> uh, in full yeah. screen now. And um, I'll be happy to, to take any questions. Let me get my other head. We're having some audio difficulties on my end, so I have to have my headphones in so I can hear everybody, or hear, so I can hear Barbara ask me the question. So, uh, yeah. all right. Well, thank, thank you, you so much, um, Jeff, for just such a fascinating um, and interesting and thought-provoking talk. And, and you know, I, the story in itself and Lucy and Suzanne's lives and struggles with identity is so fascinating, but also your reflections on the meaning of the kind of resistance they were engaged in and its significance really, I think um, is in incredibly um, useful and thought provoking. Um, so just to say to the audience, if you could put um, questions in the chat, um, but yeah, just um, a question I had was, was just where did you first encounter this story? What got you interested in the story in the first place? Well, I came to, uh, to learn about them through their photographs, um, the, the artistic photographs that they did in the 1920s and 1930s. And the person I have to thank for that is my wife. Uh, my wife is an art historian <laughs> and has taught a course on the history of photography for uh, a number of years. And uh, she was the first one who showed me uh, the photographs, uh, you know, that are credited to, they're usually credited to Claude Cahoon alone. And more recently, scholars have understood that really they should be credited to both women. Um, but uh, my wife and I were talking about it and she said, you know, you might be interested in this. And she knew a little bit about this, the, the, uh, the resistance story, but not much because really not a lot had been written about it. So as I looked at the photographs and, and learned something about their lives, um, and then began to investigate more. I, I wanted to know more, and, I, and as I wanted to mo know more about the, the, the work, the resistance work they did on Jersey, I realized that, that very little had been written about it. Um, and so I began to, to dig into that. So I, I have to give credit to my wife for, uh, <laughs> for turning mm. me onto this story in the first place. Okay, thank you. And um, Flora's got a, a question um, to follow on from that, where she asks, what, which um, part of, of this did you find the most difficult to research? Um, that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I that I one of the challenges that I had in this uh, in this research uh, has to do with sort of the 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 state of the of the remaining documents in the archive. Um, the because all of this is based on our, on deep archival uh, research. Uh, some of that on Jersey, uh, and as I said, I spent some time on Jersey uh, in their archival collection. Some of the the Jersey collection is also digitized, uh, which is wonderful, and I was able to to work on it here. Uh, from home as well. Um, but there's also a, a cache of documents at Yale University uh, here in the right. US. And uh, I, 
I looked at those and the, the, the state of those documents is very unlike any documents that I've ever seen. So a lot of those are Suzanne's post-war rem reminiscences. And basically what she did in, in the years after the war, she would sort of jot down her thoughts and it seemed like she was probably going to write something. So it seemed like maybe the early draft of some kind of memoir that never got realized, but she would write down several sentences and then she would draw a line and then she would write a few more sentences and draw another line, just going down the page, a few more sentences and draw another line. But none of those sections had anything to do with one another. <laughs> they were all completely disjointed. So I had to, it really was like putting a puzzle together. Uh, that's true mm -hmm. of all archival research, but this was even more so because I really, you know, usually if you're in the archive, each page, is everything on one page is more or less related to one another, but in this case, it was not. And so um, with a lot of electronic manipulation, taking photos of things and then sort of digitally cutting and pasting, I was able to, to piece together the narrative. Um, the other challenge is that Lucy's writing, um, some of which has been posthumously published, um, uh, is the, the French is very difficult. Um, she was a surrealist writer <laughs> uh, yeah. and associated with a surrealist and much of her writing is very stream of consciousness and very surrealist sort of in tone. Um, and it was some of the most difficult French that I've ever had to translate. You know, right. uh, I've done French for many years, but that was, that was some of the hardest <laughs> uh, yeah. translation work that I've ever had to do. So, um, so the, the sources themselves were not, were not as accessible um, and I think that may be one of the reasons why this story really hasn't been told as much. Um, I think there are other reasons as well. I think a lot of their material was lost. As I said, the, they speculated that the Germans just burned a lot of it in the fireplace. Um, there were probably other reasons too, but, um, but I think the state of the, of the documents made it difficult. Right, yes, thank you. We've got a, a question um, from, oh, we've got a few coming in now. Um, a question, um, from Jane is um, she's thanking you for the um, talk, but also asking um, what happened to the women's families left behind in France uh, during the war, and did they keep in contact? That's a great question, um, and I you know I don't really know much about uh, that because there's there was simply no archival evidence uh, to to find out. I know that that one of the reasons that allowed them to move the to to move to Jersey is that. Suzanne's mother died, leaving her some money. So, um, so, but even before, you know, so by the late thirties, um, Suzanne's mother had passed away. I don't know about other family members. I know that Lucy and her brother uh, were sort of estranged uh, for a while. It just doesn't come up in the in the documents. There are very few letters, so they were still in touch in some way. In the in the archives, there are very few letters back and forth, but it's really, they're much from a, they, they tend to be from an earlier time period and they're much more just sort of family kinds of, of business. There's really no discussion. There's really nothing from the war period. So I, I don't know exactly um, about their relationship with the family during the war. I do know though that, you know, they did think about at one point going back to France they, when the war started, they thought maybe we should go back to France. But one of the concerns that they had was not endangering their family. So um, that's the only real comment that I can make about that because there's simply no evidence uh, that remains in the archive. Now, if it, if it, you know, if the Germans burnt it <laughs> in the in the fireplace, mm. you know, um, mm. perhaps it was there, but it's no longer with us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And and uh, Lorraine is is asking if we have um, any of their art from after the war and whether it was significantly different from from the start of their earlier work in France. Uh, that's a great question. There are some photographs um, from the post-war period. Um, I'm, in fact, I showed you a couple there uh, at the end of the of the presentation, some from 1945. Um, Lucy dies in 1954, and she she's ill for, for a number of those years uh, after the war. The, the time in prison certainly was not very good for her health. So there's really not a lot. Um, most of it, most of the, of the work that I've seen tends to be mostly just sort of more um, what you might call family photographs, just casual photographs that they took of one another around Jersey. Um, nothing really of the artistic sort that they did um, in the 1920s or 1930s. After Lucy dies, Suzanne does continue to take photographs, um, but they are sort of landscapes. Uh, they're beautiful, um, beautiful photos of Jersey, of the shore, uh, but, but they're nothing uh, at all sort of related to or similar to what the work that they had done in Paris. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I suppose there's there's perhaps a couple of questions which I might put together um, 
where <clears throat> Laura's asking whether their actions challenge more traditional conceptions of resistance. And Andrea also asking if they're in touch with other resistance groups. And I suppose I wondered if you could say a word about how they fitted into resistance in the Channel Islands. You know, um, I don't. Th I think you've already made clear this wasn't exactly typical <laughs> of resistance. Um, but you know, what what was the broader context, and and did they have any contact with those resistors? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So um, there there was other resistance, certainly on Jersey um, and elsewhere on the Channel Islands. They uh, that that resistance was not um, organized in the way that we might think about, say, the French resistance uh, in France. And part of that was because Jersey is a small island and, and it was full of German soldiers. Um, and so creating some kind of organized resistance was difficult. Also, the fact that, um, that they were cut off. They were cut off from France, cut off from the rest of the continent. And so we're not able to really sort of have any kind of connection to other resistance groups or movements outside of, of the islands themselves. So, there were other people on Jersey, for example, um, engaged in various levels of resistance. Um, and there's some really great work, some great scholarship that's been written about that. Um, in terms of their relationship to that resistance, it's interesting that Lucy and Suzanne, by and large, they, they were certainly working alone. Um, and they did that intentionally because they said, we don't want to, first of all, we don't want to endanger other people. And also because we're just used to working alone, and we're <laughs> we don't uh, we don't take orders very well. I think at one point they say this under interrogation, um, and because they sort of cut themselves off, they don't necessarily realize how many other people on Jersey are engaged in resistance. So um, in some ways, it's not until they they are actually put in prison when they start to meet other resistors um, in the cells around them that they realize, in fact, there was this sort of groundswell uh, of resistance in various ways and various levels. Um, in terms of thinking about the, one of the questions that was posed about how this fits or was this, did this challenge the ways that we think about resistance? Um, there were other people on Jersey also distributing notes of various kinds. To me, the thing that's interesting about them and that's innovative about them is precisely the fact that they are, they're targeting the Germans themselves. I think that's part of what's unique here. Um, that unlike other groups on Jersey that were, that were circulating BBC information um, or that were also writing notes, um, by targeting the Germans in particular, I think that's this, this sort of campaign to get inside the Germans' head. And I think that's part of what's so remarkable about the work that they do. Yes, thank you. And, and kind of um, developing on from that, um, Leila's asking, um, how did local people um, react to the story? Was it known at the time, known after the war? Um, one of the interesting things about, uh, about the islands is that there's not uh, a sort of embrace after the war of sort of war memory or of resistance memory. There is a really sort of a desire to suppress that memory. And so after the war, a lot of people, and Lucy and Suzanne are not alone in this, but a lot of people basically want to forget the war. That's part of why I read that, that in that piece, that excerpt of the book of the woman who says, oh, now you must forget all about it. Um, and that actually becomes a relatively common thing in the years after the war. So even people who, who were involved in the resistance, who spent time in jail, um, are not celebrated for that. There, there's a sort of desire to simply kind of push it away. Um, for a whole lot of reasons, it's too uncomfortable. Um, it brings up the question about um, the British military's abandonment of the Channel Islands very early on in the war. Um, so there, there are a number of, of factors that sort of become very complicated in terms of, of Channel Island war memory. And there's been some great um, uh, scholarship on that as well. So, um, so after the war, I think that their story is known. In fact, they, they give an interview to the Jersey Evening Post. They, give a, they, they do a, a long sort of interview. Um, but it's not something that they are necessarily celebrated for, um, not in, at least not broadly. In terms of during the war itself, um, it's really, they, they don't, they only tell one person that they're doing this. Um, only one other person knows that they're engaged in this activity. And this is an old friend of theirs um, who, they, who they met on Jersey many years before in one of their vacations. Um, and um, even their maid, uh, who lives in, in the house with them and her husband who also lives in the house 
my I, I don't have direct evidence for this, but it's but it seems that the maid doesn't also does not know what's going on. So this was, I think, again, a real desire on their part to protect people from uh, from from danger um, so that if they got caught, they would bear the responsibility alone. Mm. And do you think they knew the level of risk they were taking? I think that, well, they, they say that they do. And of course, mm -hmm. m m many of their, most of their um, comments about that come from the years after the war. Um, but they, they, you know, they had been fighting fascism for a long time. They had seen the rise of fascism. They had seen what it was doing in France politically. Um, they had, you know, been involved in anti-fascist protests for a long time. I think they had, as much as anyone at that time could have, um, they had a sense that this was that this was definitely running a risk. I think they also understood how strategically important the the islands were for um, for the German army, and so you know there wouldn't have been thousands of German troops there if it wasn't a significant uh, place. And so, um, of course, that's precisely what gave them. At one point, Lucy calls it the luxury of resistance. This idea mm. that somehow we were able to do more here on Jersey than if we had been back in France, because back in France, we would probably have had to stay quiet. Um, but here on Jersey, because we have this sort of captive audience of German soldiers that we can speak to, she calls it this, this kind of strange luxury of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. And so, um, so yeah, I think that's, that's part of their thinking there. Yes. And a um, <clears throat> question on a, a slightly different term theme, Gareth uh, saying, are they only now being recognized as trailblazers <laughs> in identity exploration and gender fluidity? They were sort of, um, when they were sort of rediscovered in the late 80s, early 90s, um, this was sort of a moment when uh, there was the kind of beginning of kind of scholarship around a lot of these questions about um, gender and sexual, gender and sexual identity, um, the beginnings of what we call queer theory, um, and so I think that they sort of came, they were sort of rediscovered at a moment when a lot of scholars were, all, were beginning to ask those questions. And so I think mm -hmm. that they um, have been seen by people, especially within art history, within history of photography, within gender studies, within queer studies, um, as people who really sort of exemplified a lot of those things many decades even before, you know, before we had started to talk about that, say, in the early 90s. So I think um, um, their discovery coincided with kind of the, the creation of that scholarship. So I think that they, that over the, the, the couple of decades since then, they're frequently held up, certainly by scholars, um, as examples of, uh, of people who embodied that idea of queerness before, before it became theorized. Um, mm. And so I think that's, that's often uh, one of the ways in which people know them today. So a lot of folks who do know them, um, know them sort of through that that body of scholarship. But I think more broadly, they're, they're not as well known to a broader audience. And so hopefully this book will, will help help that. Yes. Um, and Kate's got an interesting question. Um, she's asking, to what extent do you think the manner of their resistance was predicated upon the style of their art? Um, so she suggests this might be communicating with individuals and challenging their audience, plus using their personal skills mm -hmm like German. So yeah, this kind of connection, I think, is interesting between the resistance and their art. Right. And I, I, I talk about that in the book. I think that really their, this work definitely grows out of their art. I think that the kinds of things now, of course, we only have a very small sample of their, of their notes that remain. Um, it's hard to say, you know, if I had read the hundreds of notes that they had produced, you know, I could maybe say something more definitive about that. But since we don't have hundreds of notes remaining, um, but of the notes that do remain, um, I think it is clear that they're using a variety of different genres. Some of those read like, like fictional dialogue. Some of them read, as I said, as, as poems or as songs. Um, some of them have illustrations. Some of them um, you know, take different forms. And I think what they were doing was trying different modes of communication, different genres, different ways of reaching the German soldiers. Uh, a lot of them certainly used humor. Um, that's something that I try to talk about in the book as well, um, that, that many of these notes are actually dark jokes, they're darkly funny. <laughs> uh, and I think they're very much yeah. intended to be. Um, yeah. Because I think that's another way of sort of reaching, you know, or even like the, the song lyrics that I was quoting there in the, during the trial, 
you know, about the, my wife is, or I've gone away and my wife is pregnant when I come home. Oh, don't worry. That's the fatherland needs children, right? It's a, it's a sort of dark joke about, um, you know, what is it exactly that, that the Nazis are expecting of people? And so um, I think that um, um, it's, it's an interesting relationship that's there between their art um, and their resistance. I think another example of that too, um, and that sort of comes, I think that some of that humor comes from the surrealist connections that they have. Another surrealist connection is the, um, the fact that the surrealists are also posting up um, in the 1920s, posting up notes around Paris. Uh, the surrealists call them butterflies. And so these butterflies were that, you know, the surrealist artists were doing uh, precisely to sort of shock people. They were designed to make people think, to provoke uh, people to have a, a sort of emotional response. And so I think that technique that they're borrowing from the surrealist, or at mm. least is inspired by the surrealist, is another way in which you see the relationship between their art um, and the resistance that they do. Yes, definitely. Thank you. And then we're, we're nearly out of time, but we've, we've got um, um, a final question from Jilly um, asking what you think of Rupert uh, Thompson's recent novel, um, Never Anyone But You, about Lucy and Suzanne's story? Uh, well, first of all, let me say, I know that's Jilly Carr who's uh, asked that question and her work has been absolutely <laughs> essential uh, to my work because uh, uh, she's done so much great scholarship on the Channel Islands and on the ward. So thank you for that. Um, and I cite that work uh, um, in my book. Um, you know, I, I haven't read that novel in there <laughs> and I will soon. There's a reason why I haven't read it. Sometimes when I'm working on something, I try to avoid other things, especially fictional versions of things because I don't want it to interfere with, with how I end up telling the story. So I own the book, but I've been, been intentionally saving it <laughs> until after I finished my own book because I didn't want there to be any kind of overlap or any kind of unintended uh, or, or subconscious uh, influence. <laughs> so. Right. Um, so I'll read it soon. I see that you've written, uh, that you strongly recommend it. Well, that's a that's a good recommendation. I'll, I'll look forward to reading that soon. And maybe we can talk more about that. Yes, yes. Perhaps you two can talk more about it after you've uh, read the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, thank you um, so much, Jeff. It was a fascinating talk um, and the questions have been great. And, um, you know, I've just found, I've learned a lot and it's uh, been a, a great evening. So just just remains for me to say that you can buy um, paper bullets um, at Waterstones in this country. And I think if you want a signed copy, you can go to Jeff's website. Is that right? And, and order That's one right. there. So right. yeah. Um, but yes, thank, thank you all so much um, for coming and for all the questions and hope to see you all again soon at uh, future Vena Library events and perhaps when we reopen in person as well. So good night everyone. Thank you. Good night everyone.